This is Macro Analytics, delivering frank conversations on global macroeconomics and market analysis outside the mainstream, featuring discussions and debates between Gordon T. Long, publisher and editor of GordonTLong.com and his guests. The content of this discussion is strictly the opinion of the participants. It is in no way a solicitation for business, nor is it to be considered investment advice of any sort. Always consult a registered investment advisor before making any investment decision. These discussions are extremely hard-hitting and terribly frank, and parental discretion is advised. Now, on to the show. Good morning. I'm Gord Long with GordonTLong.com. As part of our own ongoing series on financial repression, I have Mike Shedlock with us this morning, well-recognized financial writer on the web. Welcome, Mish. It's a pleasure to be on the show with you, Gordon. Glad to have you. Mish, maybe we could begin by you just giving our uh, listeners an overview of your background. I'm sure a lot of them have read your work, but how you got into this business and the kinds of things you're involved with. Oh my gosh, I got into the business. I worked in the computer business for 20 years, lost my job a after 911, started hanging around on uh, stock message boards, and um, uh, a guy named Heinz Blasnick introduced me to Austrian econo uh, economics. And um, uh, I started writing about things that I saw, you know, uh, the housing bubble that I could see. And here it was, I was out of work actually when the economy was, was booming. I, I started writing my blog with the intent of hoping that someone would find me and hire me as a writer. And instead, you know, my, my blog took off and I uh, hooked up with Sitka, Sitka Pacific Capital Management. And uh, now I'm quite happy doing what I'm doing, not working for myself rather than someone else. Are you a, are you a registered financial uh, advisor? I am. I uh, uh, have my license, Surrey 65 license. Okay. Mitch, we're, we're here to talk about financial repression um, as a macro prudential strategy. In your words, how would you define it? Uh, financial uh, repression is a set of fiscal and monetary policies for the expressed benefit of the ruling class, the politicians, the banks, the already wealthy, at the expense of everyone else. What's the goal? What are they, what are they trying to do with financial repression? Well, everyone is looking out for themselves. Some people think that it's a giant conspiracy, uh, but I, I think it's just people acting to, and getting the government to, coer to coer coerce people to do things that are in their best interest. And, and as it happens, the already wealthy are the ones that benefit most from it, so they're the ones that gain. So if we want to look at why income inequality is soaring like it is, look no more than the financial repression tactics of, of Congress, the central banks, and the Fed in particular. No question about it. Examples that, I mean, there's so many examples, but. Uh... Have you got some examples to, that you could share with us that really annoy you? Well, let's just run through the big ones. We okay. have the Fed. We've got uh, QE, quantitative easing. We've got interest rate suppression uh, in Congress. We had the bank bailouts in China. We have uh, they don't let the wand float. They've got state-owned enterprises for the benefit of the political class in China who, who benefit from these. In Europe, we've got the ECB, who now has negative deposits rates. That's in, incredible. We've got the LTRO, the TLTRO. Greece blew up. Cyprus blew up. Cyprus was particularly odious because the wealthy managed to get their money out of the, the uh, separate banks, and everyone else that was left in had their deposits confiscated to pay back the uh, bondholders in Europe, predominantly Germany. Everywhere you look, there's yeah. financial repression. Public unions are financial repression. It's, it's the epitome of, of vote, vote buying to keep politicians in office, paying people, we'll give you what, what you want. Yes, vote me back in August, uh, uh, office. That's what's going on. Inflation itself is financial repression. How do we know this? Look at who it benefits. Inflation benefits the banks, governments, via taxation, property taxes go up, they confiscate more of it. That, they don't, that doesn't even compute into their definition of the CPI. Uh, taxes aren't, aren't, aren't there. The taxes on your house, the uh, uh, sales taxes aren't there. Yeah, who benefits from this? The banks, the wealthy, the politicians. 
inflation itself is the key financial repression idea. Yeah, the government can either tax you or they can inflate, which is a, nothing more than another form of taxation, debasement of the currency. Um, and when both of those get to such an extent, the next thing is actually financial repression, which is negative real interest rates. And I don't think most people appreciate the, the, the impact of negative real interest rates over a period of time and what that means to the government. Uh, Mish, how does this fit with war? In, and I know that you, you sent me a note on this, and I intrigued me. Well, uh, war is just another example of, of financial oppression. Who benefits from it? You know, the war mongers. What is the average guy, you know, who, who has no interest in killing someone, say, in Vietnam, you know, uh, uh, have to do? To, uh, so, you know, these guys got sent over to Vietnam. They lost their lives. They lost their limbs. They, uh, uh, families torn apart. We killed how many hundreds of thousands or millions of, of Vietnamese. They have people killing people. The average guy in the United States wouldn't do that. And, 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 and who benefited from all of this? Oh, the industrial military complex. You know, John McCain is, is one of the biggest examples of this. You know, you, you have politicians supporting war projects just so they can get a defense Congress, uh, a contract in their own district so they can get reelected. These politicians never have to send their own kids over there very, very uh, seldom. They don't have to go over there themselves. Look at what we did to Iraq. You know, there was no justice. There was no basis for, for you know, for, for the inv invasion of Iraq. You know, why did we do it? We, you've got the whole industrial military complex pushing for war. You can't even get elected if you don't support war. Why? Because you're labeled... Weak on defense, Gordon. Weak on defense. Uh, but it helps fund a lot of... Uh, I've done a number of shows on crony capitalism, uh, Mish, and you, we can really see where the money goes, who's supporting it, uh, whether it's the military-industrial complex, whether it's the drug industry, whether it's this new sur uh, security surveillance complex. It's now even getting to be as, as large as the, uh, uh, as the military. But is this a developed world kind of problem? in developed economies or is this across the emerging markets? Are most countries now practicing this policy? Well, if you look at China, do you consider China emerging or not? I don't know the definition has changed, but 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 look at look at how China got where it got with state owned enterprises, with 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 uh, suppression of, of of the the yuan to uh, encourage the US to uh, deficit spend. Yeah, so uh, in Europe right now, uh, France and Italy and Spain are all clamoring for more bailouts from the ECB. It's everywhere you look. It, it, it's it's Brazil. It's it's certainly Venezuela. It's it's you know whose currency is about ready to go into hyperinflation if it's not already. Argentina is heading down the same boat. It's it's everywhere to to varying degrees, and in, in the United States, it just hasn't blown up uh, 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 to the same extent as say uh, uh, Venezuela. I don't think hyperinflation's coming here, but uh, uh, certainly if you look at average, if you look at real uh, median wages, we're back at a level of something like 1985, 1989. I've not looked at the chart recently. Maybe you have one. There, uh, Doug Short has, has some excellent charts on this. Maybe you can pop one up. But that's what it means. And, and who is benefiting from it? You know, it's, it's not the average guy on the street. And yet, the, the weird thing about all of this, Gordon, you know, is everyone's act, everyone wants Congress to do something or they want the Fed to do something. Every time the Fed or Congress does something, they make matters worse. The financial bubbles that we have are a direct result of all of these policies for the benefit of the banks and the wealthy, yet people want more. They want affordable housing. Oh, when we got affordable housing, when home prices crashed, hmm, the politicians no longer wanted it. Why? Because it hurt the banks. So here we are in the process of trying to re-blow the housing bubble. And the amplitude of all of these bubbles goes up and up and up over time. Every bottom, every top is higher than the one that preceded it. That's what the Fed does. That's what central banks do. They blow bigger bubbles over time. The average Joe doesn't benefit from it. I didn't benefit from it. 
who benefits from it? Guys like uh, uh, CEO of, of Countrywide Financial. Mozilla cashed out a billion dollars in stock options over the years before the company before the company went broke, had to be taken over. Yeah, as an old engineer here, Mish, uh, you know, when the higher highs and lower lows in an amplitude or a megaphone top, that's the definition of instability, and eventually something breaks very badly when you get that kind of uh, I increase in velocity. Uh, realistically, there's every solution is printing more money, extend, growing the, the central bank's balance sheet. There seems there seems to be no other solution to any of these problems. Is this a Keynesian problem, a, a belief in Keynesian economics, or is it just simply uh, crony capitalism? I believe these guys believe this. Look at Abe, and uh, I forgot I failed to mention Japan in my list of uh, examples. We've got Abenomics. You know, the the yen is has collapsed. Has it has it done anything for for Japan? No, it, it didn't do anything for Japan. And 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 yet they want to try it again. You know, Paul Krugman is the epitome. He's the Paul Krugman is the high priest of the Keynesians. Exactly. And and uh, he believes that Japan didn't do enough. So, uh, they have debt to the tune of 250 percent of GDP, the highest in the developed world. And uh, Krugman says they didn't do enough. Does he really believe that? I believe these guys are crazy enough to believe what they're saying. I I do believe he believes in what he's saying. But how Japan and their plan is to take down the yen much much lower, yet get inflation up over two percent. And how, with the tax base, can you can even ever get to begin to pay it? Because if you get inflation two percent, that you know what that means with the bond prices. It does, the, the arithmetic doesn't be, even begin to work. So it says you're on a on a trajectory here that can lead to nothing but troubles. But it doesn't seem to bother anybody. Is it just me, Mish? Uh, well, it's uh, you, it's me, it's the uh, Austrian economists in general. It's um, uh, uh, it's just a select few of us actually, and uh, uh, it's it's people like Ron Paul, it's people like Rand Paul. Although amusingly, uh, uh, in a, uh, uh, recently Rand Paul's had to shy away from some of this stuff, and if he doesn't, he won't get elected. So uh, like that's what it boils down to here. You got to be careful what you say. I, I, I certainly can never be elected. I, I'm 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 too outspoken. It's almost like they, they began to put a, uh, a a muzzle on them. Misha, are, would you consider yourself an op from the Austrian school? Oh, no, absolutely. I, I, I uh, uh, one of the finest compliments I ever got. Uh, a guy named uh, uh, Lacey Hunt uh, runs a, an enormous bond fund here for Washington. Someone someone uh, uh, wrote Lacey and, and asked him and said, you know, what do you think of uh, 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 of Mish? And 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 Lacey said. Well, for someone who's never studied economics, Mish is one damn fine economist. I, 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 that is extremely high praise. And actually, I actually had a, a private conversation with Lacey who told me that he had to practically unlearn everything he learned in school. Why? Because all they're teaching is, is Keynesian uh, stuff. You know, no one has ever gone back and looked and proven how idiotic it all is. I mean, this idea that you can pay people to dig a ditch and someone else to fill it back up, and that that is going to add economic benefit is lunacy. Yet the average Keynesian believes that. The average sixth grader would find it inherently ridiculous, but by the time the average sixth grader gets this stuff pounded in their head through grade school, through high school, through college, taking economic courses, these guys actually start to believe it themselves. Now, it's, it's, it's absolutely amazing. One of the tenets of Keynesian economics was that it was impossible. Keynes thought it was absolutely impossible to have a recession and inflation at the same time. <laughs> well, you know, Keynesian economics ought to have died in the great stagflationary period in the 70s, but it didn't. He they just through the came 70s. Up with some excuses to, oh, uh, I guess we were wrong about that. We're still right about everything else. <laughs> There's a lot of, this is what's going on. And you and I obviously believe quite strongly this is the case. How do investors protect themselves and, as importantly, take advantage of this investment opportunity? What sort of things should they be doing? 
Well, to protect themselves, uh, the best thing to do is not participate in bubbles. And we're in one hell of a bubble right now, aren't we? We've got a bubble in junk bonds. We've got a bubble in uh, equities. We've got bubbles. Actually, one of the biggest bubbles is, is belief in the Fed that they've got things under control. But, you know, that's nothing particularly you can, you can take advantage of there. But you, you stay away from these things. You don't be invested in the stock market. Now you wait for better opportunities. There's nothing wrong with cash, even if you don't happen to like the U.S. dollar. It's better than being involved in a bubble that's going to crash. So, uh, but I would also tell some people, you know, I think a currency crisis is coming. I don't, I, I believe it starts in uh, Japan or Europe first, somewhere outside the United States. Uh, European banks are in far worse shape uh, uh, than U.S. banks at this point in terms of, in terms of leverage. So uh, uh, what do you do you, you, to handle a currency crisis? Well, I think you put, you know, 15, 20 percent of your wealth in, in gold. And uh, uh, I would say physical gold, but you know, there's some proxies. Any proxies uh, 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 will work. It's better than nothing. So that's what I would tell people to do. And you know, get out of bubbles, buy some gold, sit back and, and wait for the crash. Now, I've expected it to come by now. It hasn't. I've certainly been wrong about that, along with others. Just because it hasn't happened yet doesn't mean it's not going to, just like everyone thought that uh, home prices could never go down nationally, never happen. And banks made a lot of bad bets on that bad assumption. So uh, uh, I think there's an assumption here now that central banks have everything papered over. They won't let the markets go down. And well, if central banks couldn't let the markets go down, then how in the heck did they crash in uh, 2007 uh, to, to the early 2009? The banks aren't in control. They've just managed to make, get people to believe that they are, Gordon. If the markets, any of them, the bond markets, the equity markets, any of them start to go down, they're so heavily leveraged today, the collateral collapse or contagion we'd have uh, would be phenomenal. They just, things like re now that's going on, just, it would just be unstoppable. So they, uh, I think that's got to fright, uh, very much frightening the central banks right now. I, I don't know if it's frightening them. <laughs> they, they, I don't. <laughs> they didn't see the housing bubble coming. Maybe I'm giving too much 2000, credit. Greenspan was joking. Greenspan was worried about inflation in 2000. And then, you know, three months later, they had this OS moment, and they had to do something about it. And, and Greenspan then went on a, a, a spree, uh, of uh, all the banks then were in trouble with, with loans to dot-com companies that couldn't possibly pay them back because they had no revenue. At the time, uh, banks were heavily involved in, in debt to uh, Latin American com uh, countries that couldn't be paid back. So what did Greenspan do to try and paper over it? Yeah, it created a housing book. And at one point, uh, Krugman denies he said it, but, you know, he said, we need another housing bubble. He says that he was uh, not being serious when he, when he said that. I, I don't know. In, I don't know in context, it looks like he was. But let's take him serious uh, that he wasn't really calling for that. He certainly has been calling for more government spending. Huh. We've got deficits as high as we've ever seen. And, you know, what is that? But stimulus, it hasn't been enough. Why? Because people are in debt. The average guy's getting, getting deeper in debt. This, this boom that we've had recently in the stock market didn't help the average guy. The average guy didn't even have any stocks. But so who did we help? And then who are we going to help again when this whole thing blows up? Oh, we're going to act to protect the banks again. So this whole environment fosters banks to speculate in bubbles and the already wealthy to speculate in bubbles and then when we bail them out which we're going to do again the average guys on the streets gonna pay for it not the guy not one person in the great financial crisis not one person in the United States you know other than uh, Maddox went to prison over this ridiculous yeah the whole corner of financial repression cornerstone of it is to use government rules, regulations to force people to take more risk. 
put them further out on the on the on the risk curve, which is in fact what we now have. But you want to call it bubbles. People that make any kind of money, all our retirees who uh, thought they were going to retire with uh, a six percent kind of return on their money aren't getting six percent. But to get it, the things that they have to do, if they can find it, are risk even there. Even they're frightened um, by it. Gordon, the pension funds in the United States are expecting seven and three quarters, seven and a half, eight, some of them. And uh, meanwhile, the pensions are, in spite of this massive rally in the stock market, the pension funds are still massively underfunded. Some of them didn't participate in this, uh, uh, in the equity rally until recently. They were in bonds. And now, oh my gosh, right at the top, they decide that they're underweight equities. So they're plowing into equities. Meanwhile, insiders are bailing out like mad as stock buybacks are soaring to all-time highs. Two trillion dollars of stock buybacks. Corporations, corporations weren't buying stocks back at, 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 in, in 2009 or 2010. They're buying shares back now with their cash now. It's craziness. Well, actually, uh, they're borrowing money in the bond market, taking the write-offs on the uh, the borrowed money to buy back the shares, even at an elevated price, so they can avoid the dividends. Now they've bought back. Unfortunately, some uh, now companies bought back are doing exactly that. Gordon, yes. Uh, you know, twenty billion at, at Oracle. I can go through them. The level of the buybacks is just crazy. Now that they've bought them all back, or in the process of buying them all back, notice the mergers and acquisitions where they're now printing new stocks to go out and buy because they can't get organic growth on the top line. So they're after growth uh, without taking the risk, a riskless investment, if you would. And now the average concerned. investor on the street is, is running to buy all of these IPOs. It's got to be somebody to take them. <laughs> and we, I, uh, you and I were around in 1999 and 2000. I've seen this, this, uh, this game play out before. You mentioned gold and, and precious metals. Uh, a lot of the listeners are concerned that at some point the government, if gold moves up and everybody believes that'll happen as we see higher and higher levels of inflation or possibly hyperinflation, that the government will take predatory action, not necessarily confiscation. What's your view on that? Uh, I don't think uh, they will confiscate it again. There are a lot of people that, that, that disagree with me. I don't think that'll happen again. I I By the way, that. FDR, uh, I consider that a treasonous action and uh, an illegal action. FDR belonged in prison. Instead, he's rever revered by the Keynesians as, as, as a hero for breaking the law, for stealing people's gold. That's what he did. It was out-and-out out theft. I don't think it'll happen again, not in the same way. Uh, my, my, my fear would be that uh, uh, should, should gold skyrocket up, it would just simply tax the hell out of it. But, you know, what do you do? You know, so uh, you can't, you know, worry about these things. I don't know when that will happen. It might never happen. Maybe that's just an unfounded fear. So th still, you know, you can, you know, cash out a little bit over time. Uh, uh, diversify into other real assets, uh, uh, lands, housing, whatever you do, don't go in debt uh, 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 for this. And uh, you know, just periodically, you know, buy some dips and take some off the table on the rallies and, and, and you'll do fine. So, I mean, that's what I would say. If you start worrying about every possibility, you're going to be worrying about everything every second. So um, uh, if and when it comes to that, there actually might be a signal. I, I don't know what it will be, but you'll probably start seeing some strange gyrations in the gold market if, if it were to come to this. Why, why are the emerging markets in the BRIC countries buying gold at such a level right now, at such a rate? And there's no question that they are. Well, they're underinvested in it. Uh, uh, the U.S. has gold, Germany has gold, Italy even has some gold. Cyprus had gold and they made them pledge it to get rid of it. This is one thing Cyprus had, actually. Uh, uh, Greece had a little, has a little bit of gold. So uh, a, a lot of countries don't have any. So, uh, yeah, they ought to be rushing to do this. Actually, Venezuela has a bit of gold now, and, and uh, uh, it, it is maybe the, the one thing standing in the way of their currency from becoming completely worthless is having some gold. So uh, uh, I think they can. Countries are are 
well, they're inherently stupid, but they don't always act stupid. Some of them can 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 see things that are coming, and uh, that's that's a legitimate reason for some of them to be buying gold. You know, they're 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 looking at at what's happened, particularly in Europe, and they're saying, you know what? Maybe we need a little bit of protection. I think they need a lot of bit of protection, but uh, uh, it's a start. What areas of the world right now are bothering you the most? I mentioned issues in Japan. You mentioned issues in Europe, and I fully agree with your comments on the European banking industry. But there's issues in China. We've talked about the United States. But what? Where? Where do you think the biggest central problem is right now? Uh, uh, I think Japan and Europe are the two biggest problems. But also, the, but the warmongering attitude in the United States. And, and I was just reading right before we came on, the Taliban is is uh, on the march in uh, Afghanistan. Uh, here we go. How many trillions of dollars did we spend in Afghanistan to allegedly rescue that country? And there were fifth, three trillion. I, I, I saw a finger there. Three trillion. That's actually Afghanistan and Iraq, but that doesn't count all the things that that we've hidden does it gordon it doesn't exactly. it doesn't count uh uh, uh, uh medical uh, uh expenses of, of of soldiers returning home you know it doesn't count their pensions a whole bunch of things it doesn't count it's probably four trillion uh gordon but it's, but, it's, but, but anyway it's substantial and it's part of the 84 trillion dollars it's really off balance sheet right now that is part of our debt that nobody seems to talk about and I'm sure you're well, well aware of it. These are yeah, and, and we're about now to leave Afghanistan. Uh, it's a, a, another job well done, right, Gordon? Yep. Uh, as soon as we do, as soon as we're completely gone, Taliban's going to take over. Wow. All the lies, all the waste, everything, and all we did the, the entire time is create more uh, uh, enemies with in, indiscriminate bombings in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, in whatever stand, you know, we, we, we seem to want to drop bombs on, on stand. <laughs> and, and made a lot of people in the military industrial complex and others associated with it quite, quite well off or better off from it. Not to be cynical, but, you know, war, war is always a uh, destroys thing, but it also makes a lot of people money, primarily the banks historically. I don't know about today, but historically, uh, Mish, we got to wrap. There's, I mean, we, there's so many great things to talk about. You've obviously got your hands around a lot of this subject. What's the key message you'd like to leave with our listeners here today on financial um, regression uh, and the markets in general? Uh, well, my key message would be if you don't have any gold, get some. Uh, if you're still speculating in financial bubbles, stop. Those would be my, my two key things. Uh, if you want an investment idea that, that's a little bit uh, uh, outside the normal, I would say uh, I like Japanese equities here. J Japan has gone through a 25-year period of deflation. There's hardly any debt on the books of these Japanese corporations. They're trading near book value. Now, the one thing you have to worry about here, though, is, is what's going to happen to the end. So, so if you like this idea, uh, uh, I would say uh, uh, get a get a yen heads position in in and I'm speaking my book I'm in this trade get a yen heads p position in 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 Japanese equities to to protect yourself from a collapse in yen if it does happen if hyperinflation uh, 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 does happen in Japan and I think it's far more likely to happen there than it is here in the United States then uh, that'll actually be the trade of the century. So uh, uh, those are my ideas. Take some chips off the table. Stop speculating in bubbles. Uh, uh, have a little gold. Have some cash. Uh, uh, look outside the box. Look outside uh, uh, the United States for uh, some opportunities. Great, great advice. Mish, how could people learn more about the things that you're involved with in your, uh, in your writing? I uh, write about the stock market, economy, interest rates, gold, silver, war, about three or four times a day, actually. And the easy, uh, I'll give you my blog, globaleconomicanalysis.blogspot.com. But that's a mouthful. So the easy way is to just do a Google search for MISH, type in MISH on, on the URL line. It'll take probably take you straight there. Otherwise, just do a search for MISH, and that will assuredly take me there. And, and Gordon, it's been a pleasure to be on the show. I love talking about financial repression. It's, it's, uh, it's certainly uh, the number one thing that's happening today. I couldn't agree with you uh, more on this mission. 
we'll have you back soon and talk and pick this conversation up again. All the best. Thanks. Thank you for coming. Bye. This has been Gordon T. Long, editor and publisher of GordonTLong.com. New recordings are posted regularly and can be found at GordonTLong.com. New show notifications are available through RSS feed, iTunes, and other social networking venues at GordonTLong.com. <laughs>